The Bible tells us a story about a man named Jesus who is God in human flesh. Are you ready? Uh huh. A long, long time ago, Jesus came to earth in the form of a baby. He was raised by his father Joseph and his mother Mary. Jesus loved God very much and grew up telling everybody about God. When Jesus spoke, everybody listened because he was so wise. When Jesus was about 30 years old, he got baptized by his cousin John. After he came up from the water, heaven opened and a voice said, This is my son. I love him very much. Listen to him. Some time passed and Jesus began to do his work. Yay! He knew he needed to spread God's word. People all around came to him for healing. Jesus knew it was time for his greatest achievement of all, so he went to Jerusalem for Passover the celebration. During the meal, Jesus held the bread and the cup and gave thanks to God and said, Whenever you eat bread and drink wine, remember me. After dinner, Jesus and his disciples went to the garden to pray. In the dark, guards came to arrest Jesus. There were some people who started to question Jesus. They were angry with him and they didn't believe him. They put Jesus on trial even though he hadn't done anything wrong. Jesus was beaten and whipped. They made him carry his cross up the hill where they were going to hang him. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Three days later, the tomb was empty. What? An angel appeared to Mary who was...
was crying by the tomb and said, Why are you looking for Jesus here? He isn't dead anymore. He is alive. Mary asked a man to take her to Jesus' body, and when the man turned, Mary saw that it was Jesus himself. Jesus said to Mary, I'm alive, and I am the light of the world. This is promise to fear death. <laughs> and we can have hope that we will have everlasting life in heaven with him. So you see, the greatest love story is the story of Jesus dying for you and me. Whenever you drink bread and eat wine, remember me. <laughs> Wait, I need my iPad so I have my No. Line. I forgot the line. That was perfect. Do one more time. The Bible. Oh. Do I have to do this? Yeah. Here's a bait. You're done. I'm done? That's it. Oh, that's quick. Yeah. You want to say anything else? Mm. Do you know any jokes? Any Pastor Bob jokes? <laughs> they were, they didn't, wait, they were mad. Can you do a, a practice of your line real quick? And, yeah. And you just look right here and say, nice and loud. <laughs> After dinner, Jesus and his disciples went to the garden to pray. You're done. Good morning, church, and happy Easter. Uh, I just hope it's a great chance for you to gather together with family and, and just celebrate the resurrection today, the fact that it did not end on the cross, that we can celebrate today because of the fact that Jesus rose again later. And that's something we celebrate every single week here at TFBC, but especially focus on on Easter Sunday. Just a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll get to the message time. Uh, number one, if you are wanting to know more information just about what we do here at Tulare First Baptist, make sure you sign up for our starting point class. That's gonna be on April 25th. So that is, th that whole point of that class is just to come together, we talk through why we do what we do, the different ministries we really love to focus on here. And, and the whole point being, we just want to tell you all there is to know about us. And so if you're interested in learning more about TFBC, please sign up for that class by going to our website, our events tab, or by reaching out to the church office. And another exciting thing we have coming up is the following week, May 2nd, we are going to be having baptism. So if that is something you've been thinking about, or maybe you just want to talk to someone on staff about, well, what's so important about baptism? please reach out to the church office so we can get you dialed in for that Sunday or, or even just talk to you through why we see baptism is so important. Uh, but if that's something you've been wrestling with, we would love to talk to you about it. So please reach out to us. And as is true with all of the events we have coming up, whether it's youth ministry related, Celebrate Recovery, Homeless Outreach, Children's Ministry, all of that can be found on our website. So make sure you're going to TulareFBC.org and you're gonna find all the info you could possibly need about what we have going on. Well, I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna to get to hear from Pastor Bob. God, we love you and we just thank you for this morning, the fact that you did rise again, that it did not end on that cross in, in a gory death, but that you rose, defeated death and paid for our sin in that single act. That even though there's nothing we could do, you already did the impossible. You, you fixed that relationship. You made it a way for us to have that relationship with you restored if we put our faith and trust in you. I just pray this morning that we would celebrate that, that we wouldn't allow it to just be something we focus on once a year, but that we'd focus on it every single day of our lives. And God, I just pray that you'd speak through Pastor Bob. Just help us to walk away knowing you more, but wanting to know you even more. We ask this in your name. Amen. Greetings, church, and happy resurrection of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In fact, today uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, certainly something we celebrate every Sunday, uh, significant to us as a people of faith. But on this day in particular, uh, after having acknowledged Christ coming into Jerusalem, that 
final week of his life before um, the crucifixion and certainly acknowledging what it means that he died on a cross for us, uh, that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then uh, we gather today to uh, acknowledge what all the gospel writers tell us about, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, the resurrection uh, changes everything. It, uh, because of the resurrection of Christ, uh, we can know that our past sins are forgiven, that we have power in the present uh, to deal with the issues of our day, uh, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, in fact, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, and we have hope for the future. And, uh, and so as we acknowledge and celebrate uh, this Resurrection Sunday, uh, let me thank you for tuning in, being a part of our celebration. And uh, hopefully you've had a chance to reflect over this past week. We often refer to it as Holy Week. And uh, certainly, uh, oftentimes, I hope, I hope you had a, a good Friday. <laughs> Sometimes people feel like uh, uh, Friday is a sad day because Jesus died, and uh, certainly it's not a sad day. Uh, in fact, if, uh, if we're going to look at it, you could, you could certainly build a case that uh, the day after Friday is a sadder day. So uh, as we celebrate and acknowledge, uh, we just need to uh, celebrate the fact that on this Sunday, this first day of the week, Gospel writers tell us that indeed uh, Jesus was risen from the grave. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, passages uh, uh, from different gospel writers. We begin certainly in the Gospel of Matthew as we've been looking and listening to Matthew's part of the story in our series, uh, Easter, Is That Me in the Story? And uh, so let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 28. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me, uh, beginning in verse 1 of that chapter. Matthew tells us, After the Sabbath, which would have been the Saturday, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you, so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said, and they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, this is Matthew's account. As we seek to blend together the gospel writers, sometimes there can be some challenges just in the timing and trying to understand exactly uh, each of the gospel writers and kind of their version of what they are uh, wanting to communicate that took place. All of them certainly agree that uh, Jesus has risen from the dead. Uh, but what's interesting that I'd like for us to think about as we reflect upon the question, is that me in the story? is that in Matthew's account, both the angel as well as Jesus indicate that the message is to be communicated to the disciples, his followers, uh, that they're not to be afraid and that they are to go to Galilee and it's there that they will see Jesus. Now, what's interesting about that is when we um, look to John's gospel, John, and, and, and by the way, I have to say, um, I love of all the Easter a resurrection stories. I love John's account. He gives us so much more detail. And John begins to tell us about an encounter that Jesus has with the disciples that takes place on that first day. And all indications are, clearly, it is not in Galilee. So we must ask the question, why, having told both Jesus and the angel that they're to go to Galilee and see Jesus, and yet we find, as John tells about the resurrection, that on that same day, that first day, the same day that Matthew's referencing here, just later in that same day, Jesus will in fact reveal himself. He will appear to the disciples. So the question uh, we need to ask is, why are they still in Jerusalem uh, and not in Galilee? Or it appears that they're somewhere in and around Jerusalem. Galilee would certainly be uh, further to the north. And so here the disciples are, uh, as Jesus begins to appear to them, as John tells it in John chapter 20. In fact, 
John tells it this way, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Now remember, Jesus just said, hey, go tell them uh, to, that they will see me in Galilee. So according to John, she goes and she says, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And then John tells us on the evening of that first day of the week, that same day, that first uh, Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw him. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, we're told, also known as Didymus, and Didymus simply means twin. And so uh, even though we're not told of uh, Thomas's twin brother uh, in Scripture, I believe the implication may be that if we're going to find ourselves in the story, at least for me, one of the places we can begin to find ourselves in the story is certainly uh, as Thomas's twin for you see, as Thomas says uh, in, the, in John's account, he was not with the disciples uh, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John tells us Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. So let's think for a moment. The question we asked earlier, why, if Jesus is saying, I'm going to uh, see you in Galilee, certainly the angel gave that instruction as well. And then all of a sudden we find on this same day, Jesus revealing Himself, appearing to the disciples, and, uh, and there's some place, they're certainly not in Galilee. We will learn that later from Luke's story as the two on the road to Emmaus come back and meet with them. And they're somewhere in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And so the question is, what's going on here, right? And how can I see myself in this story uh, and begin to, uh, to learn a lesson as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing I think we need to acknowledge is what the, str uh, the followers of Jesus are struggling with. It's quite possible that the reason they're not in Galilee and the reason it doesn't unfold as he first appears in Galilee is, is the issue that the disciples are dealing with. Let's think through a little bit of what may be going on as they're locked uh, in this room. They're all together, we're told by John, and they're locked in this room. And we know that some of them were dealing with failure from the past, right? They had failed Jesus. Certainly Peter would have been in that group. Some of them are dealing with the frustration uh, of just things not turning out the way they had planned. I think it's fair to say they are fatigued and tired. It's, it's been a very long week and certainly a long night uh, leading up to the crucifixion and certainly as we move toward the resurrection. And then clearly, as, as is stated, there's fear. They are overwhelmed, fear of the Jewish leaders. And so when you think about these four things that they're dealing with, the failure the frustration, the fatigue, and the fear, I think we can begin to step in the story and recognize that many of us, uh, certainly over this past year, and we think about uh, Easter a year ago and our celebration of the resurrection of Christ and all that's unfolded in that, in that period of time as we gather again to celebrate uh, what it means that Christ is risen from the dead. We know all too well uh, what it is to, to deal with failure. Uh, we know what it is to be fatigued and just tired and overwhelmed by uh, much of the things of this world, the frustration as things don't seem to turn out the way we want, and certainly the fear that just seems to always be there. So as we think about what it means to experience uh, these kind of things, I think it is um, fair to say we can step into the story. We can understand what the disciples are dealing with. 
And so I want to share with you something that Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1. After this experience, down the road, Peter now writes, inspired of God. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, Peter, this is the same Peter who uh, denied Christ, who was hiding in fear. And so we must ask the question, uh, what's happened to Peter? How has he become all of a sudden so bold? And what can we learn from this encounter that John tells us about, where one named Thomas, oftentimes <laughs> someone who could be a twin for us, uh, finds himself struggling to believe, doubting, and gripped by fear. Well, a couple things in this passage that I love about John's telling of the story, and as I said earlier, maybe one of my favorite accounts of the resurrection, because I love what it tells us about Jesus. First of all, um, as Peter talks about this living hope that we can have, I think we can have a living hope in our lives as, as we celebrate with Peter the resurrection of Christ, because Jesus meets us where we are. I love that because the indication seems to be that he was going to reveal himself, they would see him in Galilee. But something clearly changed, and I wonder if it was not the reality that he just began to recognize that for whatever reason, the fear and the frustration, the fatigue, and, and, and all the failures they were trying to deal with, that maybe in that moment they just couldn't figure out a way to unlock the door and, and find their way to Galilee. That somehow they were just stuck and paralyzed in their fear. And it encourages me, I, I, I love that Jesus meets them where they are. And what that tells me is that we can also celebrate that Jesus meets us where we are. He comes to us to meet us in the midst of our struggles. John tells us Jesus came and stood among them. That's a powerful word for us to reflect on. What does it mean for Jesus to meet us where we are? Uh, some of you may recall the story. I've shared this a couple times, but it's a powerful story in my life. As a father, we were vacationing in Florida. Our son, Robbie, uh, Robert, was there, and, and uh, he, had, uh, he was young and had this little swimsuit that had the floaties in it, and, and he had just enjoyed jumping in now the pool, and we certainly, as parents, felt better because he had those, uh, those floaties in this uh, swimsuit he was wearing, and kind of just, it allowed him to just kind of bob up and down. That's why we called him Robert. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, as he would uh, enjoy uh, swimming in the pool, uh, we just kind of were able to relax a little more. Well, later in that day, uh, we had gone to get a bite to eat. He took off his swimsuit, obviously, and he's down around the pool. We're just kind of uh, eating at some picnic tables there, enjoying the sunset over the, over the water. And the next thing we know, we hear a splash. And uh, sure enough, we turn around, and, and Robert has jumped into the pool, except this time he does not have his a floaty device swimsuit on. And I literally, through the clear water in the pool, I can see him just sinking to the bottom as he goes under the water. Very quickly, I jumped in. And, and my point is, I, I, uh, my love for my son, uh, just there was no hesitation. I jumped in to meet him where he was at. Because obviously as a young man, in that moment, he, he would have drowned had someone not saved him. He was not, he did not have the capacity uh, as a little boy, or the ability to somehow get out of that situation on his own. And I share that with you because I think it's a picture of how much God loves us and how God comes to where we are in the midst of our struggles. He meets us where we are. And many of us, uh, certainly today, I want to acknowledge if you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then the reality is we are literally drowning in our own sin. And that's the need we have for a Savior to come and meet us where we are. The Bible says, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He comes to meet us where we are. And it's so much about where the crucifixion is all about. The second thing I think we can learn from John's account of this story and maybe why it was Jesus revealed himself here as opposed to Galilee is what seems to be indicated 
is that he also encourages us with his presence and his peace. Notice uh, three times in this brief passage, uh, two the week before when Thomas is not there, another time when Thomas is there, over and over, Jesus continually um, says, peace be with you. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that Jesus desires for us to have peace, not just for the disciples and his followers on that day, but certainly for us even today. And for Christ to be in our midst, just as he promised, as we gather together to celebrate and worship him, that he desires to meet us where we are and to bring to us peace. In fact, in John 14, after he had shared the Passover meal, he washed the disciples' feet. We acknowledge in, in John chapter 13, much of the celebration of Monday Thursday and, and how Jesus speaks into their life. We're told in John 14, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. And they were troubled because they were hearing things Jesus was saying and, and they couldn't quite understand. It didn't all make sense to them. And in that passage in John 14, Jesus says to his followers, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back. And then he says a little later in that passage, I have told you before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. You see, I believe Jesus, after the resurrection, sees his followers locked in this room, dealing with fear and frustration and all the failure. And, and, just, and he recognizes that he needs to meet them where they are. And he needs to remind them of who he is and encourage them with his presence and his peace. Not only does he do that for the disciples on that day, I believe he wants to do that for us as well. See, Jesus knows what we need, and so often what we need is peace. And I just want to encourage you as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, maybe there's something in your life right now that's causing you to just be stuck in some place, and you need an overwhelming sense of God's presence and God's peace. And I, want to, I just want to pray that God will meet with you in that moment, remind you of what He has already said, so that we can have peace even in the midst of the storms and craziness of this fallen, broken world. The next thing John tells us about is, he said, after this, he showed them his hands and his side. We might think of it in terms of he shows his love for us. It's as if he wants to remind us, wants us to see how much he loves us. 1 John 3.16 tells us, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, uh, this... Um, Power of God revealing who Jesus is, confirming that indeed Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Uh, may we know what it means to celebrate as well how much God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Certainly God wants to show us his love for us. Well, the last thing I really want to uh, focus on as we look at John's story and maybe ask the question, you know, why is Jesus revealing himself to them in this, in this place, somewhere in and around Jerusalem, as opposed to Galilee, which appears to be what was initially stated. And I believe it's because he wants to meet them where they are, certainly encourage them with his peace, show them his love, but he also wants to speak to them that they might come to believe. And that's particularly true of Thomas. Uh, you know, Thomas wasn't there the first week uh, he happens to be there the second week, which is a pretty big deal because someone who's pastored for a while, I know being in church or with other believers the week after Easter is actually the bigger challenge. And so I want to encourage all of you, next week, uh, Jesus is going to be in the house again. May we uh, continue to gather and celebrate the resurrection. Certainly for Thomas, that becomes a, a significant day as Jesus uh, comes and says to Thomas, put your fingers here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side. And then he says something very powerful. Stop doubting and believe. Friends, that is very powerful. And it tells us something about Jesus, our Savior, how much he loves us. And he recognized for Thomas, it was so important that Thomas come to believe. Luke tells us about two on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus came alongside them and had a conversation. And what Jesus begins to do as he speaks to them is he helps them to understand the importance of the prophecy, of the scriptures. In fact, they would later say, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? You see, what we begin to discover is that Jesus again and again wants to speak to us, wants to help us to believe 
in fact, what the scriptures have already told us. You know, as we think about God speaking to us, there's a couple of things that that come to mind. How does God speak to us, you might ask? Well, certainly through his word, that becomes very clear. He emphasizes our need to be in the word. And in fact, uh, we're going to be uh, starting in a couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you in community groups, want to encourage you to, to, to stay with us as we continue. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter and studying together God's word and allowing uh, Peter after the resurrection to begin to tell us some things about what it means to live as a follower of Christ in this world. And so when we think about studying God's word, being devoted to the word of God as the early church was, uh, we need to recognize it's, it's because God speaks through his word. And there's times he wants to say, just as he speaks directly to Thomas and says, stop doubting and believe. I'm convinced that Jesus wants to speak a clear word to us. May we have ears to hear and a heart to receive. Certainly God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. His spirit, as we pray for God's spirit to be into our lives and, and continue uh, to work in our lives, just as in the very beginning we're told God created, said, let there be light. The spirit of God was present and creation responded. And scripture teaches that we become a new creation in Christ. And I'm convinced that the Spirit of God, in conjunction with the Word of God, continues to speak into our lives in various circumstances. You see, I've found in my own life <clears throat> that one of the ways God speaks is certainly through circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances are needed to get our attention so that God can begin to speak to us. He speaks through His people, certainly as a pastor. Uh, I hope that God can speak through me in times and, and, and address situations in your life, certainly through friends, the people of God. God uh, on occasion will speak to us. And that's the importance, again, of studying God's word together with other believers. And then God speaks through prayer. As we take time to pray and, and uh, lift up our requests and our concerns to God, may we also always be open to recognizing that prayer is a, a two-way conversation. And may we be listening to, to what God wants to speak to us. I'm mindful uh, as we celebrate Easter of one of the baptisms we had in this past year um, shared a story about how God spoke to her through the banner on the side of our building. In fact, she was going through a difficult circumstance, uh, some health challenges and some struggles in her life. And she talks about in her story how she came to the intersection of Cross and Cherry. And all of a sudden, God drew her attention to a banner hanging on the side of our building that said, you belong here. And she would tell the story about how God spoke to her in that moment, in her circumstance, in her struggle as she was praying. And how she would later find her way to church, feeling as though God had clearly spoken, you belong here. Concerned, maybe a little scared and fearful about coming into a place where she didn't know anybody. And she tells the story of how she found in church believers who welcomed her, who encouraged her, took interest in how can we pray for you and help you. And out of those circumstances, in the midst of her struggles, God was able to not only meet with her, meet her where she was, but encourage her with his presence and peace. And God was able to show her how much he loves her. And as God spoke to her, she was able to respond and receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we celebrated with her her baptism uh, just a few months ago. You see, I'm convinced that God doesn't want to just do that in her life and in the lives of those disciples and Thomas and Peter and the other disciples gathered in that room, locked in that room for fear. But God wants to do that for us as well today. I don't know, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know where you are, but I know this, God knows. And God wants to meet you where you are. And he wants to bring his presence and his peace. He wants to encourage you in that way. And I pray, in fact, God will be able to do that even as we celebrate this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday together. May God show you how much he loves you. May that be evident in your life. And I pray you'll not miss what God wants to speak to you, even now, as he reminds us how much he loves us. And maybe the message he has for you is the same message he had for Thomas. Stop doubting and believe and find in Christ the life and the love that God has for us. It'll transform you. It certainly did, Thomas. And my prayer is it will for us as well. May God bless you. We'll see you soon.